Well, morning everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Wells and I have a confession to make that despite this WWDC uh, shirt that I'm wearing, I'm actually an, an imposter. I can't code. I've never written a line of code in my life. I can't design. I've never built an app. Uh, but I have paid very close attention to the App Store over the last couple of years and um, I've had the opportunity to kind of play around with a lot of apps before they, they were released, give some feedback, that kind of stuff. And I've really been fascinated by the App Store, as I'm sure you guys are, although you guys have a lot more at stake <laughs> in the whole thing. And so the presentation I wrote, um, the original presentation I wrote was about uh, how you could kind of uh, elevate your app through the noise of the App Store and get noticed. And then at about three in the morning, I freaked out and rewrote it because um, I thought Stuart gave a much better talk on that yesterday. Now, I don't know if anyone saw Stuart's uh, presentation, but it was fantastic. Uh, if you missed it, it will be available online uh, eventually. But it, it was just such a brilliant, uh, brilliant uh, idea of what you need to do to kind of stay, uh, stay, I guess, focused on the App Store and also just make sure that your stuff rises to the top. Um, he's a very clever man and also really beautiful and humble. I love, the, I love the fact that he can just casually say, oh yeah, yeah, five hours work and 2.2 million downloads and it ain't no thing, you know. So I don't really have, yeah. <laughs> I don't have anywhere near the, uh, the respect to even say something like that, to pull something off like that. So I, I would ask you to look at uh, Stuart's uh, talk when it does come online. And another uh, area that uh, to look at, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the conference, One More Thing. Uh, the, it ran for the last three years down in Melbourne and it was a really fantastic event. Uh, I was lucky enough to be a little bit um, involved in it. I didn't really do much in terms of the organising but it was amazing to see the whole event uh, get, get put together uh, by some of my dear friends. And the reason I, I point you towards that is uh, One More Thing they, they put all the videos up online now at, on YouTube for no cost at all. So if you haven't had a chance to, to watch through them, uh, there's about 12 presentations over the three years, uh, some of the greatest superstars in uh, app development. So if you have, haven't had a chance, they're all free now, so please go and check one more thing out as well. But yeah, the, the, I guess the idea for this talk came from the post that Jared Sinclair wrote about his, his very beautiful app, Unread, and the fact that he wasn't able to make enough money to sustain himself or his family uh, on the App Store. And I thought the, the post was actually very well written and very, very devoid of emotion, which I thought was really uh, refreshing to see. But the, the talk that kind of bubbled up around it was very much not. There was, there was a lot of kind of hand-wringing and what can be done about this fact that uh, no one can make money in the App Store anymore. And I just wanted to kind of address some of that a little bit. So I won't go into the specifics of Jared's post because he, he does a far better job than I could. But the main takeaway from it is after 12 months in the store, Unread earned around $32,000 before tax. Jared says in real world terms, that ended up being about $21,000 all up after he took out his health care and, and taxes and all of that kind of stuff. So 12 months, $21,000, not, not the greatest amount of money that he could make. And he just, you know, again, he, he doesn't really lay blame in, in his posts. He just kind of sets it out as this is a real world version of what the App Store is like these days. That the money wasn't enough to sustain himself or his family and certainly not enough to get rich quick, which is, you know, that was the kind of dream of the App Store a, little, a couple of years ago. And far less, I guess, than he would have earned in a corporate gig as well. And so I had a look at some of the stats around that after, after I read the post, and I found this, um, this little post on uh, TechCrunch that said that Jared doesn't seem to be alone. In July, a study of 10,000 app developers found that 54% of all the profits in the App Store were going to the top 1.6% of developers. It's kind of depressing. The same study showed that 64% of all app developers earn less than $500 a month on the apps that are in the store. The gold rush, if there ever was one, does seem to be over. And I was wondering, so why is this? Why can't a passionate, talented indie developer eke out a living on the App Store? Is Apple doing something wrong? Is it time for an Occupy App Store movement? Uh, many theories are kind of floated on a regular basis on blogs and podcasts. The most popular, uh, we see it all the time, is this race to the bottom idea. It's the idea that uh, pricing on the App Store forces apps down to a 99 cent price point and that no one can really make money off that. 
I'm not a huge fan of this argument, to be honest. Um, I know I'm not an average App Store punter by any means, <laughs> but according to my accountant, I've spent just over two grand on the App Store since it, uh, since it was released in 2007. That works out to be about a dollar a day for the last six years, which is kind of terrifying when I think about it like that. But, you know, I don't think I would have spent so, so easily if apps were pr priced at a higher price point. If it was $9.99 for an app or whatever you feel that your app should cost, I probably wouldn't be impulse buying them as often as I do. I hardly ever buy Mac software, but the App Store have ma made impulse buying an absolute art. I bought cool looking apps waiting for a bus and already deleted them by the time the bus arrived. That's how quickly I churn through stuff on the App Store sometimes. And I still browse. I still browse the App Store every day, but I've got to admit my spending has dropped. Generally, I'll buy a $50 gift card every month or so, plug in the App Store credit, and then look for interesting things to buy over the next month. I love finding killer new apps before my friends do and telling them about it, so I'm always looking. So, how do you get me to buy your app? Well, this is probably the wrong room to say this, but for one, <laughs> Android does help. Um, now, I know it's a really th dumb thing for me to say, especially as someone who doesn't know how to code, that, you know, why don't you just write something in Android? Like, I realize that's just about as arrogant as me saying, hey, have you ever thought about writing in Cantonese? Because I've heard the Chinese market is quite big. I'm not trying to say that. I'm just saying that for me personally, it's a much easier sell if the app that you're making can at least talk to the Android world or at least acknowledges its existence. You know, for a lot of apps, it doesn't, it's not a really big deal. I love something like Fantastical, which obviously I use with Google Calendar, or Tweetbot. There's no way I'm ever going to switch from Tweetbot on, on iOS, but that's, they're both using web services as their back end. I guess for me more, if you're going to fo focus on iOS, um, you really need to have some kind of back end like that that can at least talk, or uh, you're tying into another service that can at least talk to Android. Because if your app only ever works on iOS, then I'm only going to be able to use it half the day, and I'm only going to be able to recommend it to about half my friends as well. So that for me is why Android apps are, are still a big deal. And I've got to say, uh, Shifty Jelly, one of the reasons I constantly go back to Pocket Casts is it is beautiful on both platforms, and I can easily move between the two throughout my day. But for me, what makes it even better is when, when a friend comes up to me and says, hey, what is the best podcast app out there? I can just say, Pocket, uh, Pocket Casts, without first asking, hey, what phone do you have? And that's a really big deal. I also think customer service goes a long way. This section is going to be quite short. I'm not going to tell you, you know, things you already know, but customer service goes a long way. It's not unusual for me to discover an app on a blog or a review site, and then before I install the app, I'll track down the developer or the app's uh, account on Twitter and just see how they uh, interact with their customers. You know, perhaps I'm far too entitled about that, but if I'm going to drop a couple of bucks on your app, I want to know that I can tweet for support uh, if I need to. And yeah, sure, a really beautiful FAQ or a well-designed support page is great as well, but I'm pretty lazy, so I want to tweet you. So I'm going to really check that before I actually put some cash down on most iOS apps. Um, and to be honest, I'm actually far more annoying if I love your app. If I hate your app, I'll probably get rid of it after, after a couple of minutes playing with it, but if I love your app, you're going to get emails from me all the time, tweets from me all the time, suggesting stupid things. You could ignore them, feel free to do that, but I am that kind of annoying customer that just suddenly, if I get invested in your app, I'm going to harass you all the time about it. And that's actually, that brings me to the next point, which is to in, uh, identify your most passionate users out there and really turn them into the, the beta testers and cheerleaders for your app. Um, quite a few, again, I'm very annoying, so quite a few of the, annoy, uh, of the developers I know out there have just kind of to shut me up, put them on their bit of testing programs, and it's been a really great way for me to kind of get to know what the, the features are of a new app before it comes out, and I really, really love that, and I think that there's a lot to be said about identifying, I know I've, I've heard other developers talk about it in the past, about identifying that core group of guys who just love your app and will want to go out and evangelize it for you. Um, you may as well tap into them. I can tell you some things not to do. I honestly don't know how I ended up on this spam list, but I'm on some kind of weird App Store spam list 
that emails me every single day with about four or five different emails uh, of, of apps that I should install. Sometimes they actually do include the, uh, the beta codes and things as well in there. I'm not too sure. I think it came from MacTalk somehow. I ended up on a list. But um, it's really bloody annoying. And after, <laughs> after a couple of weeks of getting these, um, I've now filtered them. I never send them in my inbox anymore. So I don't know. If, is this like a service? Have you guys been approached by some kind of service like this? Yeah, there are. Please ignore them. They're a pain in the ass. So don't, don't waste your money on that kind of stuff. And like, while I am happy to try new apps, and, and I do spend probably more than the average puncher out there in the app store, I've just got to say there are certain categories I'm done with. Uh, I think that is kind of an app store genre fatigue is how I describe it. When I look at a category like a to-do list app, I know I've bought all of those that cost money, and I've played with all the free ones that are VC supported. So when a new to-do list comes along, something like Clear that is so different, that might be enough for me to try it. And yes, oh yeah, you can see that I bought Clear down there. But if it's just a standard to-do list, I'm really pretty much done. Over the last six years, I've probably spent you know, a good $20, $30 accumulatively on to-do list apps. And so even though I don't want to do it, and even though it's not your fault, when I see your new app, that mental sum is going in my head. I'm thinking, it's not just, I'm buying this new to-do list app. I'm, I'm thinking about all the other pr uh, purchases I've made in that category over the last couple of years. It's, it's, again, it's not really fair, but that's, that's what I do. And so that brings me back to Unread. I think that might have been a factor in Unread. Uh, there's, there's probably not a huge market out there for RSS readers. And for me, although it did look beautiful and I did see the reviews as it popped up, I think the timing was just off. It came so close after the death of Google Reader that I was kind of really you know, hurt by RSS. I, w I wasn't ready to love again. And so I wasn't <laughs> prepared to, to move from a service that I just started using Feedly to un um, Unread, no matter how beautiful it looked. Another of the really popular theories as to why the App Store is pretty much impossible to make a, a living off these days is the top lists. The top charts, it says, um, kind of reward the indie incumbents and the big players. There's just no room in the charts anymore for new players to find an audience. Marco Armand is actually pretty fond of saying this. He says it all the time on uh, ATP. that. The charts actually don't reward developers who, are, who make great apps. They reward developers who can game the system. Look, he's probably right. I accept that the charts suck, which is why I don't really spend much time in them. I tend to look for reviews, places like Touch Arcade, Mac Rumors, that kind of thing, and then click through into the store. I don't spend too much time browsing the charts, even though I know that's probably where a lot of other people do, a lot of the, the base of your customers are probably spending time in the, the charts. But I, I think it's wrong to kind of place the blame on the charts themselves. Because if you look through any of iTunes, the charts are full of crap. It doesn't matter what section of the iTunes store you're in. Every section of iTunes has its Zynga and its EA. Every section of iTunes rewards the most bland and formulaic crap, while interesting, unique, and lovingly crafted products fail to find an audience. Every section of the iTunes store has the clones that have just been uh, designed to quickly tap into a very popular franchise that's out there and try to make money off it. By the way, Titanic 2, amazing. Really, really worth seeing. Does it sink again? Uh, <laughs> it comes back. <laughs> it comes back. It's fantastic. Also, every section of the App Store has a Kardashian. Now, I don't really have a point to this. I just find this such an interesting... Uh, take on the world. Uh, for people wondering, that's app, TV show, song, book, and movie. She is quite the Renaissance woman. The point of all that is the app store is no better or worse for the little guy, for you guys out there, than any other section of iTunes. It's really hard making money off something you want to do. It's really hard making money off creative endeavors. It's unfair, but sure, that's capitalism. The app store is not really broken. It doesn't need fixing. Well, all right, search definitely needs fixing, 
but everything else kind of is working the way it should. There's not so much Apple can do to step in to fix the discoverability, I don't think. Apple does go a long way to address the, uh, the discoverability issue, as we all know, by featuring apps, and that's about as much as I think you can hope Apple can do. It's great that they actually care so much that they invest time into highlighting apps that may otherwise be forgotten. Despite all this, despite the, the relative hardness of breaking into the charts to get noticed on the App Store these days, I still do think there is room out there for indie, indie developers. Even if it's an already established group of popular apps on the App Store, even if there's a popular free alternative that dominates the market, even then, a well-crafted app can launch and be a success. But fuck Marco. Marco is different to you and I. Marco is an indie app maker the same way John Favreau is an indie filmmaker. I could probably make an indie film tomorrow, but I probably can't get Scarlett Johansson to appear in it. Same way, you could probably make an indie app tomorrow, but you're not going to get fireballed. You're not going to get on TechCrunch. So let's look at something a little bit more realistic and a little bit more relatable. I want to tell you guys about an app that I absolutely love. It's called Triptastic. It's from Sydney. It's uh, uh, an entire one-man development and design team put this little uh, guy together. It's a real-time real public transport app that started in Sydney and works in many cities worldwide, although, unfortunately, not Melbourne, because Melbourne... Don't, don't blame the developer. It's totally the Melbourne public transport's fault on that one. But yeah, Triptastic should not have been a success. Not only did it launch just last year, but it launched into an incredibly crowded market. First up, of course, there's Google Maps, the free app that everyone knows, trusts, and uses daily. In Sydney, and almost everywhere else in the world but Melbourne, Google Maps includes public transport data as well. So it's already there, it's already a name that people know and trust, and it's free. Around the App Store, there's a couple of other alternatives too. There's Transit Times, which is uh, an interesting take on the tra uh, transport app thing. It's a little bit too... Uh, Mm, how do I say that? Uh, Overcomplicated, I'd say, for my, my liking. There's also TripGo, which is a really fascinating app. It actually uh, it has its, an extra little f feature of uh, giving you kind of how green your journey is going to be as a way of dif differentiating itself. So really fascinating stuff, and that one's free. Actually, Transit Times also has a free ad-supported version. So we're, we're getting a lot of free here. But the big one in Sydney comes from TripView. Now, TripView, I'd say if you grab any Sydney Siders iPhone, Android phone, or Jesus, even Windows phone today, they'll have Trip, TripView installed. TripView launched in February in 2009 and has been consistently in the top 10 apps ever since. Nick Ma is one of the very lucky developers who has been able to turn this one app into his full-time job. It's a great app. But into this market struts Triptastic. Rupert Hansen is the young lad behind it. He ain't no grouper famous. He's not even Marco famous. He's a nobody. But Triptastic released in March 2013 after months in development. Rupert decided not to go with free or ad supported like most of the, the apps in the, in the market, but rather charged $2.99 for it. As you can guess, this kept a lot of people from trying the app. Public transport apps are one of those categories for me though that unlike to-do list apps or notes, I'll take a punt on any time. I use public transport every single day, so if someone has worked out a much better, faster way for me to access that data, I'm going to go to it straight away. Now, according to Rupert, first day sales were good, thanks to positive press and a bit of Twitter coverage, but immediately the apps kind of dropped off. Sorry, the sales kind of dropped off. So like I said, that was in March. I didn't actually find out about the app until May when uh, these posters started appearing all over Sydney. Now, New, uh, Transport New South Wales was trying to shut down their SMS service that they had and move people onto smartphone apps. I love the fact that there's this kind of generic Android-y device, um, but half the apps on there are iOS. Uh, but that, that was the poster that kind of popped up around Sydney. So I guess if you, if you do want one takeaway uh, sales technique from me, I'd say get your app featured on a poster that appears in every single train station in Sydney. That seems to be a good way to go. As you can imagine, that actually did help the sales of Triptastic when that, those posters started popping up, and that's when I bought the app. I bought it, as uh, most of my very 
well thought out sales are. I bought it because I thought the bus looked cute. Look at its little face. So Triptastic was a weird hybrid of an app. It was the information you could already get for free from Google Transit, and it was smushed together with this kind of timetable view that made TripView so popular. As someone who uses public transport multiple times a day, uh, and no kind of set route, I do change, I, I go from many different sites, so I'm constantly using different routes. It really made a lot of sense to me, and it was a much faster app than anything else I had used. But I knew that there was no point for me to recommend it to anyone I know. It was just way too complicated. It was just a strange, strange app. And for lack of a better term, it was only really kind of necessary for public transport power users. Like, that's such a silly thing to say, but it kind of, that's the only way I can kind of describe it. For, for, for your standard punter, they just needed their public transport app to tell them what bus to catch in the morning and what bus to catch to come home. And that was it. And TripView was already doing that fantastically well and very popularly. But despite very small sales to begin with, um, Rupert kept working on the app, and in 2014, in January, the app received an absolutely gorgeous iOS 7 update. Rupert said it took about five months to complete, and the interface was totally stripped back. By doing so, the app be became much faster to use and much simpler. It was a beautiful 2.0, but I don't think it could have been made if he hadn't played around with the idea in the 1.0 and really worked on what needed to change and, and also get that feedback from users. He said he got a lot of feedback of people saying they just didn't know how to use the app. It, would, it just gave them too much on launch. Now bear in mind, I had no idea who the hell Rupert was. I only met him a couple of weeks ago. Lovely kid. But I did ask him if I could focus my, my talk today on this app. I'm not cheerleading because he's a mate. I'm cheerleading just because I love the app. By around this time, he did put me on his uh, beta program for the iOS 7 uh, app as it was coming out. Um, and so I'd send the, the odd bug, bug report and from, and you know, kind of got a little bit of feedback in there. I can't remember what I changed. There was something I did change that managed to get into the app. Oh, that's right, yeah, the, uh, the ability to turn off other uh, transport features. So I use buses most of the time. So I said, look, sometimes it's a, if I'm standing around Central Station, it's too much to see all the trains as well. Piss that off. And he did, lovely guy. So anyway, <laughs> like I said, the App Store was incredibly crowded with transit apps in Sydney. But Rupert took a punt. He was motivated to make Triptastic, not to really make money, but because he thought there was no app out there that was really satisfying his needs. And one, th one other thing is he's a total train nerd, so that's adorable as well. I really like a train nerd. But um, yeah, he just found nothing out there that was really kind of tapping into the, the transport app that he required. So we built the app he loved, and it turned out okay. So after all of this, Triptastic had now been in the store or been in development for 18 months. So any guess on how much money he made after 18 months of development? Anyone? No? <laughs> A little bit better than that. So yeah, 18 months, 14 grand. I was kind of hoping for more when uh, we first met up and I, I told him I wanted to use his app as an idea. Um, but yeah, that seems to be... Oop, I've lost my mouse. There we go. That the, the sales for Triptastic did kind of fall down on the, the standard App Store story you've always heard. Uh, there were the peaks for the opening sales weekend. There were the peaks again when those posters started popping around Sydney. There were the peaks when he made the iOS 7 app. Uh, especially that became featured by Apple because it was such a beautiful kind of version of iOS 7. And there, there was still that time where there weren't a lot of apps that had been updated for iOS 7. So he did very, very, uh, very well to uh, make sure that he was ready on time, just as Stuart was explaining yesterday. But yeah, after that, Triptastic is now kind of, um, the sales have kind of fallen away. And he's getting about 8 to 10 units a day on Triptastic. Definitely not enough to live off. And to make matters worse, the app has now been overtaken, for me, in my heart at least, by another app in the App Store. But Rupert made that one too. This time it's a happy train. Uh, based on the lessons learned in the ver version one and version two of Triptastic, Rupert refined the idea of transport apps to make them faster and better. Next they're launched July 3rd this year. This time the app is ad-free with ads, 
but you, there's a subscription model as well to remove those ads. What I really like about the app is it kind of it takes the exact same um, issue that, that Triptastic was trying to tackle, but does it in such a unique and different way. It just gives you this absolutely beautiful, clean interface when you first launch the app. And the really cool thing as well is it so it tracks you as you move. And so when I, when I launch the app, if I'm standing near a bus stop, it's only going to show me the next closest bus stop to where I'm standing. Um, so it's just one of those apps that without any interaction at all, it's already uh, delivered the, the information you probably want. And I think that's really, really cool. When I've shown it to other people, they actually, it actually blows their mind that the app is kind of following them around and can kind of guess what they want beforehand. Now, if you use Android, you might be a little bit familiar with that kind of stuff anyway with Google now, but this is the coolest implementation I've seen on iOS, and this is way, way better than anything that's in the Android store at the moment. It's super, super fast. It's super, super pretty to look at. And I think it was just a really, really cool way of, of tackling this pro uh, problem. Sorry. So the core problem, as Rupert described it, was what is the fastest way to go from launching the app to getting the information that you want? That's what he tried to do after playing around with Triptastic, and I think he absolutely nailed it. Now, in terms of the uh, in-app purchasing, I know some people kind of hate or love in-app purchasing. I think it kind of works in this, this uh, instance. The experiment to go free with in-app subscription was based on the many tweets that he received and comments he saw around Triptastic that $3 was just too damn much for a public transport app, which is an absolute, just a heartbreaking statement considering your average ticket price in Sydney is $3.50. Like, I think you'd, uh, you should be able to pay less than the standard ticketing price on a train for an app that you're going to use for the rest of the year or maybe a couple of years. But, oh well, that seems to be the market we're in. But I like the fact that he played around with it. Uh, that he experimented with what he should be doing with this next version of the app. And it worked. Free got people in the door, and he got a hell of a lot more people in so far. And the conversion rates have been pretty good. The subscription model is an interesting one, and to be honest, I don't like it. I'd prefer to be able to pay once, one kind of uh, you know, $5 remove all ads feature, but I understand where he's coming from. Uh, the subscription is a 12-month subscription that, that gives you ad-free until, obviously, the 12 months is up. I find that a little bit... I don't know. But again, um, I'm not the kid. He's, he's the kid making the app, so fair play to him. And I love, it. I love the app. So, in terms of money made. Uh, now, Triptastic has only been out in the store now for three months. And it's already made a hell of a lot money, more money than Triptastic did. Sorry, next there. Next there is the orange one. Next there has been out for three months and has already made as much more money than Triptastic. Now, Rupert has asked me not to go into the specifics of how much it has made, which is a shame. I'd like to share them with you. But it's a decent growing revenue. It's not enough to buy an island, um, but it's enough to get by in Sydney. And for Rupert, it has, made, it has led to some really serious contract work as well. Again, unfortunately, I can't tell you what the contract work is, but hopefully in a couple of months he'll be able to put together a blog post about his experience because he's ended up getting a really, really awesome uh, contract gig based on this. And I think that's really cool anyway that being, he was saying, uh, he, he was straight out of uni when he made Triptastic. And so for him to create, sorry, for him to, to try to take on a contract without any App Store experience previously, I think he knows so much more now about how long a project will probably take to develop. You know, all of those specific things that you can only find once you've actually put something in the store. So I think it's worked out really, really well for him. And more importantly for me, I just love the app. I use it two to three times a day, so I'm glad money wasn't the only motivating factor for Rupert when he was building this app. Because if it was, he probably would have stopped at next, uh, he probably would have stopped, sorry, at the first version of, of Triptastic. He wouldn't have put another five months into creating Triptastic 2, and he certainly wouldn't have made next there based on the money that he had made so far. But I think the lesson there is clear. Find the thing you really want to make, make the hell out of it, make it better, make it better again, and if you think it's time to make a whole new app, well, yeah, do that too. Adapt to the market, experiment with payment models, identify your Uber fans and turn them into cheerleaders for your app. The gold rush might be over, but you can still really make a lot of an impact with these passion projects. And you can really tell that this is something, as a trained nerd, he cares a lot about. 
And if you want to look at a different way of measuring success, right now, Next There, after only three months on the store, has 40,000 active daily users. That's 40,000 users who know how late their damn bus is going to be because of his app. And 40,000 users that are invested in Rupert at the moment. That's huge. And for me, I reckon that's a success. And this story is kind of similar to the only experience I've had on the iTunes store. I've been on iTunes now for about six years in the podcast section. We never really needed to worry about a race to the bottom because podcasts have always been free. There were indie podcasters up against us with uh, much better production values than we could ever hope to achieve. Uh, there were the big companies like NPR and ABC and BBC creating great, great fantastic content, working on budge with budgets, again, that we just could not ever imagine. But we still, you know, appeared in the store and we gave it a crack. Famous faces still dominate the charts in the podcast area, but we've actually had a pretty successful run. Now, the two podcasts I do at the moment, uh, I don't expect you to subscribe to either of them, but the two podcasts I do at the moment um, are Shoot the Glass and Reckoner. And to be honest, I've made very little money off podcasting. In fact, off these two little guys, I've actually not made a cent, uh, which makes the six years of putting aside a couple of hours a day, uh, a couple of hours a week to create and record and edit and publish these shows, eh, you know, <laughs> it could be, could be better time spent, but what are, what are you going to do? But I did make a little bit of money off this show. Uh, Mac Talk ran for about five years, and we made about 250 some episodes. But I only made money during two years of the run. One year I pocketed around six grand uh, based on in-show advertising. The next year, around six grand in advertising again, and then another 25 grand or so for running the site itself. So all up, it was about 37K that I've made in the podcast section for lack of a better way of saying it. It's not bad, but it's not exactly a livable wage. Still, I consider myself very lucky. I've probably made more money than most indie podcasters out there. I mean, no one cares about podcasters, so we haven't bothered to do a, a, a study on how much most podcasters make each month, but I'd say it would be underneath the average app developer's salary. But again, I couldn't think of any image for this slide. I just thought that uh, it would have to be some kind of really awful, you know, stock, footy, uh, stock uh, picture of, you know, a guy shaking hands or something. Anyway, but I don't really focus on the money made. So the, the rest of it's going to be blank for a little bit. I don't really focus on the money I've made. I focus on the relationships I've made and the opportunities I've had thanks to the podcast. The job I have today was indirectly thanks to the podcast, which is a weird thing to say, but true. I've been paid in travel and experiences. I've been able to meet a lot of people, some of the people I've considered my heroes, and some of my favorite podcasters and developers. I doubt I'd be speaking to you guys today if it wasn't for the podcast that I do. And as wonky as the show still sounds every time I listen to it, my God, it's so much better than the first episode we did. Five, 500 episodes ago now, Mark at the back of the room there and I sat in a room together in Richmond and recorded just a horrendously bad podcast, but I think we're both much better at t talking these days based on the, the experience we've had ever since. And I really hate this term, and so please, for the love of God, don't tweet it, but there's no other term for it. Podcasting has increased the value of my personal brand. Um, look, I really do feel as dirty as you are saying that right now, so please, once again, don't tweet that. But I think it is worth thinking about the personal brand. And I think Jared's personal brand has been increased by the fact that he has been so open with what he was able to uh, experience on the App Store and the, the lessons he learned from them. And I think it was a really fascinating online debate that started from that post. I, I'm really, really glad that he posted it because it really kind of showed some of the numbers in real terms of, of what people on the App Store were actually making. But if there was a message I'd give to you, I'd just beg you, if you have an idea for an app that you want to make, Please just make it, regardless of how much money you think it's going to bring in. And tell me about it, or tell other people about it, and get them to be cheerleaders for your app. Because we might love it too. So start with what you love, and make it. And then make it better. I'm always waiting to find that tiny new app that I didn't know I needed, that, was going to, that is going to make it to my home screen. Hopefully, it could be yours. And for all the doom and gloom, look, I do know guys who have made money on the App Store. Indies can still make money. I've met some of them. Some of them are in the room. 
I mean, Stuart is so goddamn talented. He's made money off experiments, for God's sake. So, look, just give it a crack. And as much as I made fun of Marco Armit earlier, I think he did everything right with the launch of Overcast earlier this year. Marco's celebrity surely helped get his app noticed. And the app's launch was featured everywhere from Mashable to TechCrunch to Daring Fireball to The Verge and everywhere else. His famous friends used every opportunity they had to promote the app before it launched. And Marco released the app free with in-app purchase to unlock all the features, which meant there was no barrier to get in there and at least try the features. That cool feature where you're able to try uh, the speed up in five minute chunks was also really cool, but probably something you could only ever pull off in a podcast app because of the, the length of most episodes. But yeah, if Stuart's and Rupert's and Marco's experiences are anything to go by, I guess this is exactly how you should be releasing your app right now. Free, possibly with in-app purchases to unlock some of the, the key features. That seems to be the killer, the, the killer step right now. I'm sure that's going to change in six more months. The App Store has changed so many times in the, the time I've been watching it. But even if I could try the app for free, he gave me a clear reason to buy the app. The smart speed, the voice boost, all of those features were very clever. The Twitter integration was great, and it was great to be able to see the shows that my friends were listening to. I know Mark, Marco will never build an Android version of Overcast, but the web player was a simple way of bringing some kind of cross-platform uh, compatibility to the app. But none of that made me put down five bucks or six bucks or however much it was for Overcast. What made me spend money, because I knew I was going to go back to Pocket Cast after I played with it a little while, was this little screen here. I threw Marco a couple of bucks to Overcast just because I loved how classy this screen was. If you didn't see this, when Pocket Cast launched, oh, sorry, Overcast launched, Marco included a screen in the settings app pointing to some of the other indie apps out there that kind of inspired Overcast over the years. Um, and I thought it was just a really, really cool way of, of, first of all, a bit of viral marketing. I saw this image retweeted a hundred times the day that Overcast launched. But it was also, you know, if we go back to that personal brand, Marco's personal brand sometimes errs on the side of a bit of a dick. And I think this really, really helped kind of negate some of that. I, I've got much more respect for the young lad after I saw this screen. And I think it was such a clever idea. So purely based on that, even though I knew that I was going to go straight back to Pocket Casts, I threw him six bucks anyway. Not that he needs it, but I did. And while I'm publicly admitting my love for Marco these days, which is a very strange thing for me to admit to, I'll mention that he did actually discuss this whole Jared Sinclair article and some of the, uh, the ideas around how to make money on the App Store and, and what, are some of the, um, what are some of the roadblocks these days in two episodes of ATP. So that's episode 77 and 78, if you want to check that out. Um, they're both wor worth a listen. Uh, it's, it is a fantastic show, I have to admit. So go forth, you talented young kids, and build me something pretty. And the next time you're bummed out that your app can't find an audience, or that your app is up against some VC-funded free version, at least you're not up against Taylor Swift, or any, any other section of the App Store, uh, any other section of the iTunes Store, sorry. And I'm sure as hell glad that Taylor Swift isn't recording tech podcasts. Because it really is hard making money on the App Store. But that's half the fun. Thank you. <laughs>